So today we're talking about John Edward Robinson, born in 1943 in Kansas, to a mom that believed in hard discipline and a dad that believed in hard liquor. Now, that combination would actually prove to create one troubled, naughty, naughty little Johnny. Disciplinary issues with his teachers, with authority, dropped out of every school that he decided to attend. And the last school that he decided to attend was to get his radiographer's degree at a junior college. But he decides to drop out of that because you know what? It finally clicked to him. That faking shit was a lot easier than being real. So with that, he decides to just forge some radiography credentials. And then there was a poor Dr. Wallace. Dr. Wallace Graham decides to hire this young man, give him a chance, don't do any background check. And John, instead of just being happy that he got a job, that he was getting paid more than his weight, decides to start embezzling. He embezzles to the tune of $33,000. This is 1969, $33,000 adjusted for inflation is a quarter of a million dollars in today's money. So now, now you start to understand what kind of piece of shit that we're dealing with here. And with that money, he decides to go ahead and start himself a little family, a woman named Nancy. They got four kids, two twins. Very nice, very nice, John. But he would be arrested for this. But guess what he got, okay? I'm gonna just take out my wrist, give it a little slap. Three years of probation. So what does a psychopath think about three years of probation? He violates it immediately by leaving the state. He moves to Chicago to become a salesman. What does he do? He embezzles more money, okay? So now he gets extradited back to Kansas, and what do they do? Extend his probation. What does a psychopath think about extended probation? I'll give you guys a little time to think about this. He violates it again. He starts a fake company with false claims to sell securities to people. The SEC gets wind of it, charges him with securities fraud, and gives him, do I need a drum roll? Extended probation. What does the psychopath think of extended probation? No, he does it again. This time he's charged with mail fraud. Extended probation. Look, guys, I understand this is a much simpler time. And maybe the belief in mankind, you know, that a man could change for the better was very strong back then. But really, this man, they were not trying to show him the inside of a jail cell. And you guys will be so overjoyed when I tell you that by 1977, a 34-year-old John Edward Robinson was now a Sunday school teacher, moonlighting as a softball coach. Isn't that wonderful? A real beacon in the community he was, right? A true salt of the earth. Now, was it because he changed his ways and people saw it? Was it because now he had this unflappable character that people admired? <laughs> no. What he did was forge letters from civic leaders, from politicians, from anybody of power in Kansas City so that he could earn himself a seat in the board of directors of a charitable organization. Okay, now here is where you're gonna witness the level of his narcissism, okay? He holds himself an awards luncheon. You know, it sounds like everyone's gonna get something, but the main prize, he gives himself. He gave himself Man of the Year, guys. We did it. You did it, John, you're the best. Now, do I really have to tell you guys that he gets arrested for embezzlement again? from that charitable organization. Now, this time though, even though they didn't throw the book at him, they actually threw like an equivalent of a pamphlet or something at him. They gave him a whopping 60 days in jail. Okay, now, those 60 days, they thought, you know, that would change a man, you know, but not dear old John. The moment he gets out, 
He starts a fake hydroponics business and starts gathering investors. He would even swindle $25,000 from a person he considered and they considered as good friends. And just in case you wanted to know, 25 grand then is equivalent to $83,000 today. Now I wanna bring you guys to 1984. Now not only is Michael Jordan entering the NBA, but we have John Edward Robinson entering the arena of serial killers. Welcome to Monkey Tales. Intriguing true stories wherever we can find them. Told by me, the left-handed monkey. If your idea of a good time is a good true crime, then subscribe or you're gonna regret it. Now, I wanna share with you guys a story, okay? Now, it's very heartbreaking, but it's also very heartwarming, okay? It happened in 1985 when a 19-year-old Lisa Stacy checks herself into a battered woman's shelter called Hope House with her four-month-old infant daughter, Tiffany. Now, you can imagine a girl that young in a place like that, very vulnerable, very scared, okay? She would go on to meet a man named John Osborne. Now, we're not gonna beat around the bush. John Osborne was John Edward Robinson, right? In the guise of a rich businessman who was showing a lot of sympathy for this young girl and her plight because he was just gauging her weaknesses, gauging you know her fear, gauging what he can get away with. And he was offering her a job for a lot of money babysitter while she's working and he promised her you know you'll be back on your feet in no time you don't have to worry about why you're in a place like this the brute that did this to you you know and, and you know Lisa being 19 years old being down on her luck she thinks to herself most likely you know like maybe her luck has changed we all want to think that way right when we fall on hard times so she accepts the offer. So of course, there is no job waiting for 19-year-old Lisa Stacy. Whatever plan that John had for her, she would never be heard from again. She would never be seen again. And as a matter of fact, her body has never been recovered till this day. Now let's go ahead and move back to that point and just move a few days forward. John calls his brother with some amazing, fantastic news. See, John's brother, has been trying to conceive with his wife and they just could not do it. They went through the adoption process and just found it a complete nightmare. But John, he was able to do it, you know? He talked to a few higher ups, he pulled a few strings and he did it. For $5,500, you know, customary legal fees. If they paid that, they would have themselves a four-month-old baby girl in their care in no time. John's brother was ecstatic. Paid the money, they got the baby. I don't, I don't have to tell you, right, who that baby was, okay? They would go and rename her Heather Tiffany Robinson, and she was raised by two loving parents. One of them was John's brother. Now, that goes to show that the way their mother was and their drunken father was did not fuck up anybody. John was fucked up on arrival. So Tiffany was placed in a very loving environment and John, well, she's always known him as Uncle John. Well, that was until the year 2000 when the cops arrested Uncle John and charged him with numerous murders, certified serial killer and the cops would look at Heather, Tiffany, and just scratch their heads, and they knew about this fishy adoption that happened between John and his brother by now. So they had her go ahead and take a DNA test, and it would prove to them and reveal to her that she was the daughter of the missing Lisa Stacy, one of Uncle John's victims. Now, we have to look at this story this way because there's just been so much darkness, okay? Now, even though Lisa made that fatal decision that day to go with John, that decision actually gave her daughter a very good life. 
So hopefully that brought a little light to all this darkness, you know, made, made you guys a little bit more happy. But <laughs> that can't last long with John because I got to drag, I got to drag you guys back to 1994. And that is when John discovers the internet. So now you have John just scouring these naughty, naughty chat rooms looking for his next victim under the username Slave Master. So he was just looking for his slave. Anybody that liked to role play as the submissive one just hit John up. You know, this pudgy, creepy looking dude. But you know what? He'll satisfy your needs. And unfortunately, he sent that out into the internets enough that 45-year-old Sheila Faith would take the bait. Now, it started off as any type of conversation would in that type of chat room, you know, BDSM, what is your kink, you know, what turns you on? And eventually, John just kept building the trust with her. He kept building that trust until eventually they were just delving into real life. Now, of course, he was a rich businessman, but for Sheila, you know what, life was a bit more tough than that. She was living off her pension and her daughter, 15 years old, had spina bifida and she was wheelchair ridden. The bills were piling up, especially the hospital ones. You know, life was tough and John was hearing all this. But of course, he was just going to use it as ammo as he begins to press all her buttons. And he goes on to offer her a job, well-paying and health care for your daughter. Now, the trust is already built. John knows it. So what is there to say no to? Okay, so Sheila makes that decision. Packs up her and her daughter from California all the way to Kansas City. And I probably don't have to tell you anymore. Okay, they go missing, never to be heard from again. But John would, for the next seven years, cash Sheila's pension. So by 1999, the name Slave Master was actually very popular in the BDSM community, in those chat rooms. Like, if he were to offer you a job, it held some weight in that community. So he was offering a job and a bondage relationship to a 21-year-old named Isabella Luwicka, and she would accept, move to Kansas City. But she didn't vanish right away. Now, before we continue on with the story of Isabella, <clears throat> You guys remember I told you he had a wife, right? And four kids, couple of twins. Guys, they're still there. They haven't gone anywhere. They've been here the entire time. I've been telling you about all this shenanigans. He was doing it during work hours. With the money that he was stealing, pensions, you know, embezzling, you know, that was just a front. This is what he was really doing. So now that we remember that he is still married, you know, for a man like John, why let a perfectly good first marriage interfere with a perfectly good second marriage? He drives Isabella down to the county registrar, buys himself a marriage license, but there would be no prenup. No, 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 no in this love story. But there is a 115 item slave contract, which pretty much gave John control of everything Isabella had, especially her bank account. Now, Isabella, you can go missing. So now you have John back in the chat rooms, just stalking, stalking, looking for his next prey. And he would run into 27 year old Suzette Troughton, a nurse from Michigan. And he would offer her the opportunity of a lifetime. You get to travel with me and see the entire world, all expenses paid, as long as you will be my slave. And you know what, Suzette probably thought to herself, you know what, this is Slave Master after all. This is an opportunity of a lifetime, all expenses paid, you know what? She heads on over to Kansas City and is never heard from again. But this is where things would actually start to unravel for John. Because prior to this, when the other women went missing, all he had to say was, she went with that guy. She went by herself. I have no idea where she is. And then the smoke would just clear. And he would go about his business. But not with Suzette's family. Because the moment that she went missing, his phone was already blowing up by her mother 
asking questions. And other loved ones, they were calling around Kansas City because they knew where she was supposed to be, who was she supposed to be with, and reporting her missing. Now, John was, you know, he was starting to feel the pressure. You know, the walls were closing in. What John chose to do would actually make it much, much worse for himself. He was typing out these letters, putting Suzette's name at the bottom as if it's from her, sending it out to those pesky family members like her mother, you know, to give them the answers to these darn questions that they were asking, like, where is she? Okay, but the family members picked up on something. Suzette would never, ever misspell her dog's names. And even more egregious was the fact that the letter was so well written and their family knew that Suzette was a terrible writer. And what would this do? It would actually awaken that beast that has always been out for John, the Kansas City Police Department. And you know what? They would nudge their buddies over in Missouri. Hey, guess, look at this guy. And now Missouri had their eyes open too. So they started surveilling John at his house. They were even going through his garbage, okay? And one night, they were able to find a bag that was just full of shredded documents. They took that back to the station, laid it out on the table, and painstakingly taped each piece back together, and they would learn about a locker storage room in Missouri and a little farm in Lacine, Kansas, not too far away. So the team that was responsible for surveilling John were witnessing him put up different women in different hotel rooms. And there was that one night where he just didn't want to do himself any favors. He decides to beat the living daylight out of one of them. She manages to escape, tell the police, and she wanted to press charges. Then another woman comes forward and says that he stole $500 worth of sex toys from her. She wants to press charges. So now police have what they need to go knock on John's door, place him under arrest. This whole thing of cops. He was looking around and go, why are there so many cops? They take him down to the police station, sit him down, and John would ask the detective, you guys are making a pretty big deal out of this, aren't you? Thinking, you know, that the charge was battery or theft. Until the detective, cool as a cucumber, places a photo down on the table. It was a picture of his storage locker in Missouri. Then he puts down the second photo of that little farm in Lacine. And he watched John go completely pale. Because they're not supposed to know about these, are they? The storage locker in Missouri would contain three 85-pound drums containing the bodies of Beverly Bonner, Sheila Faith, and her daughter. At the farm, in similar drums, they would uncover Isabella Lewicka and Suzette Troughton. He was sentenced to death on January 21st of 2003. He's still serving in the El Dorado Correctional Facility, a maximum security prison in Butler County, Kansas, as of the making of this video. So if you guys enjoyed this video, please hit the like button. And if you guys want my weekly uploads, then go ahead and subscribe. Now, if you guys know a naked baby, Go to happyedition.com. My wife and I sell baby onesies and we'd appreciate it because it would directly support the channel. Now here is your guess the punchline. Why do I put a nacho on my shoulder before I do competitive sports?